While the stealth affair strayed pretty far into its own thing in the Bond franchise, we have another weird one this time around. But as a side note, there was yet another Bond-based parody game series that originated in 1990 called James Pond that went on to spawn five total games. It's a it's James Bond as a fish. So the stealth affair was simultaneously an original Bond story and a reworking of another existing game in a point-and-click style adventure. But this time, we're straying away from 007 entirely. A James Bond game that doesn't feature James Bond? Sounds like madness, and it just might be. Enter his nephew of the same name, James Bond Jr. So I knew close to nothing about James Bond Jr., even though I've owned the game for many years. I've never seen the show before, until doing research for this video. I checked out the first two episodes to help get an idea of the characters and plot before giving the game a shot, and, well... It's about exactly what I expected from an early 90s cartoon borrowing elements from a successful franchise. The origin of James Bond Jr. goes all the way back to 1967 with the release of a book called The Adventures of James Bond Jr. 003 and a Half. Very clever indeed. It was written by R.D. Mascot, which apparently was a pseudonym, and it was uncertain as to who the actual author really was. It was later discovered to be author Arthur Calder Marshall. Fast forward all the way to 1991 when it was developed into a children's cartoon show. James Bond Jr. ran for one season for a whopping 65 episodes and was produced by Murakami, Wolf Swenson, and MGM Television, the former of which also produced the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles show in the late 80s and early 90s, which was a staple show of my childhood. The style of both shows are very similar. James Bond Jr. as a show definitely feels like an early 90s cartoon and features a lot of cliches and character archetypes you'd expect from a show like this. James Bond's nephew is headed to attend prep school at Warfield Academy and just happens to be roommates with IQ, the grandson of the MI6 quartermaster Q. Also among his crew of friends is the son of Bond's CIA friend Felix Leiter, Gordon Gordo Leiter, who is hilariously characterized as the stereotypical 90s surfer guy using slang words like dude and yakola. Basically the Michelangelo of the show. There's also Tracy Milbanks, Bond Jr.'s sidekick, Phoebe Farragut, who constantly crushes over Bond Jr., and Trevor Noseworthy IV, an overly Britishized student always trying to get Bond Jr. into trouble. This will not be an analysis of the whole show, as I only watched the first two episodes, so I'll only briefly mention a couple thoughts I had before moving on to the game itself. Maybe down the road I can talk about this series as a whole if there's any interest in something like that. We'll see. Episode 1 features James Bond Jr. in a car chase with THE Aston Martin DB5 before showing up late to start prep school. How he's driving the actual DB5 is beyond me, but after meeting all of his new friends and classmates, he is confronted by Jaws himself the steel-toothed villain from The Spy Who Loved Me and Moonraker. Jaws speaks now and is a typical dim-witted cartoon henchman taking orders from Scumlord, the leader of Scum, which is basically the specter of the show. Scumlord seemed more like Dr. Claw from Inspector Gadget, who was ironically a parody of Blofeld, Bond's main nemesis, then Blofeld himself. Scumlord is accompanied by a white dog named Scuzzball, a direct reference to Blofeld's white cat. Bond Jr. eventually stops Scum Lord and Jaws, who ends the climax with the absolute most cliché line you could possibly think of for a show like this. You ready? Say it with me now. One, One day, day I'll, I'll get, get that, that Bond kid. kid. Episode 2 is called Earthcracker and has an interesting plot of the actual Goldfinger and Oddjob from Goldfinger trying to uncover El Dorado, the lost city of gold, in order to melt down the gold into gold bricks. It's definitely something ridiculous that Goldfinger would do, but there's only one problem. This is actually Goldfinger and Oddjob, not relatives of them like most of the other characters in the show. Both of them perished at the end of Goldfinger, but nah, whatever. It's a kid's show taking place in an alternate universe. I can't look too much into it. I don't know what they were doing with Oddjob here, but while he still uses his bowler hat as a weapon, he's now sporting shades and a purple jumpsuit with gold bling around his neck. I gotta say, that was unexpected. Overall, I guess it's fine. A show like this is definitely of its time. It was probably a good introduction to the Bond franchise for some preteen kids. If you've ever seen the original Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles cartoon, it's very similar to that, just with inserted past Bond characters and references. I wonder if I would have liked it as a child, since I didn't even care about James Bond until I first got into the GoldenEye game. The series ended in March of 1992, and while it spawned a toy line, board game, books, comic books, and a video game, it has since been lost in time without a DVD or streaming release. 
Perhaps it came out at the wrong time, since James Bond was pretty stale at this point, and it was more suited for older people who grew up with it in the 60s and 70s. However, yes, there was indeed a video game of the show released on June 20th, 1992. As stated in my last couple parts, the film franchise remained on hiatus until 1995, so the interest was probably pretty low at the time. James Bond Jr. was published by THQ, a video game publisher that originated in 1990 until they filed for bankruptcy in 2013. THQ created a ton of games over that span, stemming across a lot of franchises with some few noteworthy ones being Saints Row series, a lot of WWE games, Red Faction, and of course, 50 Cent Blood on the Sand. But James Bond Jr. would be their only entry in the Bond franchise. At the time of 1992, the NES, Super Nintendo, Sega Genesis, and Game Boy were absolutely dominating the industry. Games like Tecmo Super Bowl, Street Fighter 2, Super Mario Kart, The Legend of Zelda A Link to the Past, Madden 93, Super Mario Land, these were all topping the sale charts and are all considered classics to this day. It was time for Bond to move on to home consoles instead of the computer age alone. This would be their debut on Nintendo consoles as James Bond Jr. was released for the Nintendo Entertainment System and the Super Nintendo simultaneously, although apparently the two versions are very different from each other. So let's check out the back of the box for the Super Nintendo version. With a name like Bond, you know that intense action and daring adventure are here. Join James Bond Jr. on several missions to root out and destroy the evil forces of scum. Crisscross the globe as you battle the evil Dr. Derange in Central America and the nefarious Maximilian Cortex in the shadowy canals of Venice. All the while, collect fabulous items that enhance your personal weapons into an unstoppable arsenal. Take on the scores of enemy jets, missile launchers, and robotic devices designed to end your adventures permanently. Do you have what it takes to fight your way to the deadly confrontation with the Scumlord? Sounds pretty faithful to the show. Let's do this. So the game starts with James Bond Jr. getting his assignment from IQ. Dr. Derange has stolen a priceless statue which can open a lost temple. Then the actual game starts with some 2D platforming. This is definitely something different for the series at this point. Bond Jr. moves pretty stiff as you can see, but it controls fine. He collects some shoes, fight off one single enemy, and then it's over in about 15 seconds. Uh, right? Part 2 begins, and ah, here's something familiar, a vehicle stage. Bond Jr. is then inside this handy helicopter that has infinite bullets and bombs. What it does not have infinite of, though, is health, however, as running into anything or being shot once will instantly make the copter crash. The controls on it are actually pretty decent, though. If you're used to a Super Nintendo game and the controller, it will control exactly how you think it will. You can fly in four directions while shooting down enemy helicopters and dropping bombs on radar stations and tanks. In a way, it surprised me that since this is an adaptation of a children's show, they still have Bond Jr. straight up murdering a large number of enemies here. You don't just kill them, you blow them right up. Along the way, an ally copter will give you either a shield or a new weapon on occasion. Pretty standard upgrades for a game like this. Eventually, you'll reach a cavern that can be tricky to navigate with missiles in the way. At the end is an enemy helicopter that you gotta shoot down, and then it's on to level 2. Level 2 is a continuation of the platforming from the first part of level 1, and, well, yeah, it kinda sucks. The saving grace for it is that since this is a Super Nintendo with a Super Nintendo controller, it's not all awful. You do some simple platforming while collecting hearts for health and some secondary weapons while dodging some dudes behind masks and snakes. Lots of snakes. I'm not sure if there are episodes that these levels are based on, but there are a couple descriptions that could match it. Maybe if I delve more into the series in the future, I can pair things up more. But hey, I recognized IQ! There he is! The rest of the game seems to alternate between platforming and driving levels, which is to be expected for a Bond-based game. It's just... it's fine. If you're a sucker for classic SNES-style games like this, you'll get something out of it. But there are much better games of its kind out there. With that said, the controls are better than most of the Bond games that we've seen so far for sure. It only took playing as a relative of James Bond from a children's cartoon to get there. I say give it a whirl, uh, it can be a little challenging at times though. 
The NES version, however, is a completely different game. I can't believe that these were released simultaneously. It definitely looks and sounds like a standard NES game, but I mean, what is even happening here? It's a standard platformer from the start with jumping and shooting, but this game loves springboards for whatever reason. Some of these jumps are pretty difficult for so early in the game. Apparently, this version is more puzzle based, but if you want cleaner platforming, let's just, uh, let's, let's say the Super Nintendo one seems to be the superior version here. So that about covers the James Bond Jr. chapter. It's interesting to see, although you could consider it not part of the James Bond series at the same time. I simply wanted to check it out as it's still part of the franchise's history. It has since been pretty forgotten, and I'll never know if I would have enjoyed the show when I was a kid or not. I was 5 and 6 years old when the show aired, but I never even heard of it until I started to learn about the Bond games way back when. But next time, we are most certainly going back to an actual James Bond game. They've kind of strayed off the path for a little bit here, but we have now approached the very end of the Domark era that all started back in 1985 with a view to a kill. Five games later and eight years later and we are at their sixth and final entry with their only game on a home console. Thanks again for sticking with me in this retrospective. Do not forget to like, subscribe, tell your friends, or whatever you feel like doing if you want to help out my channel. It's all very appreciated, seriously. James Bond will return in James Bond 007 The Duel.